Data platforms. When I first started in the data world, for many people, a data platform was a SQL Server instance running underneath someone's desk, and maybe you had some automated scripts on top of it. But since then, the term has kind of exploded. We've gone from perhaps using it more generically to companies basically coining themselves as cloud data platforms, and the term data platform engineer becoming more and more popular as people are trying to create systems that make it easier not just to get the data out and break silos, but to actually do things on that data, right? Especially as the world is trying to go towards everything AI, that we're trying to find a way to actually make data more useful and make it easier to get to that point. And over the last decade uh, in the world of data, a lot has changed, but a lot has stayed the same. So I want to talk about what a data platform is, why your team likely needs to consider building one, and what components you should consider as you're trying to put together a data platform. Now, depending which company you look up and which company is trying to sell you what product, you'll likely get different definitions of what a data platform is. For example, if we look it up on Snowflake, it'll say that the primary objective of a data platform is to deliver real-time business insights through data analytics in a cost-efficient, scalable, and secure manner. And it'll also reference things in terms of like data management cycle uh, and things of that nature. Whereas if you go to IBM, they'll claim it is a technology solution that enables uh, collection, storage, cleaning, transformation, analysis, and governance of data. This can both include the hardware and software components. I, I do think that's also important to consider not just the software, but also the hardware, because there are a lot of technologies today that don't just specifically uh, make software that make your data processing and management easier, but as we're trying to manage larger data sets and data sets that range from not just structured to unstructured, building things up from the ground up is important for some companies as they have very unique use cases. But again, some of this is very technology focused. I think there's also a lot of aspects of data platforms that involve people, right? Like, yes, obviously, to some degree, a data platform is a set of technologies that should make the ingestion, then storage, transformation, analysis, and again, AI uh, workflows easier. But I like Dylan Anderson's uh, article that he put out for issue 22, where he was talking about kind of deciding about your data platform's philosophy, where he also references the fact that, you know, one, that the goal of a data platform is to make sense of your data, is to like actually make data useful one way or the other. And it does so by empowering business users to make better decisions, breaking down data silos, right? You can actually integrate that data, ensure that there's consistency of data across the organization, right? That's generally where data governance comes in, make sure you have some sense of understanding of how data actually translates um, across the business, what terms, etc. Also makes it easy to adhere to uh, compliance. I think that's also an important part of your data platform. And it should make it easier for various end users to work with data, right? Meaning the data engineer should be able to make data pipelines easily and put them out. Meaning that ML engineers should be able to come into your system and deploy models easily. Meaning that analysts should come to your system and your data platform and be able to interact with data easily and not be confused. So there's aspects of your data platform that are one technology, there are aspects that are how you actually build your data, and there are aspects that actually how you manage and maintain that data. So a data platform really has all of these aspects in it, but the goal is to actually make data usable for your company. And that takes me to my next point, which is why do you need a data platform? The biggest thing again for me is one, like I just said, make data easier to use. That means doing things like making it easy to integrate or join data from disparate data sets. It also means making it easy to process and manage data throughout its life cycle, right? Like it shouldn't be a very complex task every time in order to set up a data pipeline. One of the benefits when I worked at Facebook was setting up pipelines really was one of the easiest experiences I've had. It really was just creating your pipeline script and then pushing it into production and it just worked right you didn't have to spend time figuring out okay how do i create dependency management or how to do all these other things you could just easily push it and on top of that you didn't have to consider how to manage the actual underlying compute or the underlying data pipelines themselves you just pushed it right there was a data platform team that managed the rest of everything else and more importantly it should make it easy at the end of the day to create the service layer there are tons of use cases that we're supposed to be doing with data right we read all these blogs about what people are doing with data, but if people aren't doing it, or if people are blocked in doing it because of technology or various other reasons, you know, maybe it, it has something to do with what policies are set in place, it doesn't benefit the end user. That's why we're trying to make it easy both to do BI use cases, as well as, you know, as people are looking to ML and AI. Sure, those are things that we'd like to add on, 
and make it very easy so that the end users can come in and create these ML flows without having to spend hours, maybe days or months just to set up basic infrastructure. So now that we kind of understand why and what a data platform is, let's start diving into what the large components are. So looking at the components that make up your data platform, this is often where you see those fancy charts and not everyone needs everything you see in these fancy charts, right? Like companies are all at different stages. Some companies are still on SQL Server and it's working just fine for them. It can be frustrating to deal with little, some little nitpicks things that you run into, right? Like running out of space on your SQL Server, but you don't have to build a complex data platform to make it easy to work with. And in fact, in some cases, some people probably have the opposite uh, experience where they put so many tools in their data platform that now they're having to spend time managing it and not enough time actually working and deploying uh, new code. But I think a lot of people probably think of the heart of many data platforms as the storage and compute, right? Like the actual components that do the heavy lifting. And again, in fact, this is why a lot of those solutions such as Snowflake and Databricks have coined themselves as cloud data platforms because they don't want to just be considered uh, a data warehouse or a data processing engine. They want to be so much more. They want to be the tool you think of as the baseline foundation. And they've done a lot in the space, right? Like when Snowflake came out in 2012, it was one of the first solutions that really separated uh, storage and compute and made that easy for end users to interact with and then take advantage of, right? Now, instead of having to spend time on your SQL Server instance, trying to figure out uh, if one process is going to block another because it takes up you know, a lot of memory or just trying to make sure you have enough storage left. Now we can just go and essentially have infinite compute and infinite storage and obviously pay infinite bills. And they were the first solutions to really build on the cloud and build data warehouses that were with a cloud first mentality. You know, if you had uh, been working in the cloud before, you probably worked on Redshift and often ran into a lot of the similar issues that you would uh, even running things on-prem because it was still tied to storage and compute. And of course there is Databricks, which has taken Spark from just being a managed service essentially and put so many more layers upon it, right? Like now you have things like being able to run your own Databricks workflows, although some people aren't big fans of that. And of course, there's still other solutions such as BigQuery, but also that these aren't the only tools that are becoming more and more useful, especially in a world that's trying to handle larger data sets, especially those that are less structured or unstructured completely. For example, Vast Data has built itself from the ground up. So instead of taking, you know, things like S3 and EC2 Compute, they have built their own storage and compute engine that has allowed them to actually support companies like Zoom and XAI in building data platforms that lets them run their ML and AI workflows far easier on these unstructured data sets. And the fact that they've built their solution from the ground up, it means they've been able to fine tune their systems to specifically handle these data sets really well. Unlike the platforms we've already discussed, like Snowflake and Databricks, uh, which are very tailored and, and structured to handle semi-structured and uh, structured data very well, Vast Data aims to unify structured, unstructured, and semi-structured data uh, all in a single platform, which is why uh, so many companies are looking to Vast for their AI and ML needs. In fact, in many ways, Vast Data complements solutions like Snowflake and Databricks by offering an ultra-fast unified storage that bridges the gap between performance and scalability. It provides a robust backbone uh, for enterprises managing massive data sets and who are trying to tackle all of these ever-changing data needs. Now, of course, the other option in terms of storage and compute is also the open source route. You can use things like Trino or Presto to run uh, your actual compute, and then you can store that in something like S3, all without having to essentially pay a vendor. Uh, you might pay, depending on where you're running it, uh, some AWS cost or GCP cost. It just depends where you're running it. And it's important to point out that Snowflake, Databricks, Vast Data even, like they don't limit themselves to just doing storage and compute. That is where a lot of people think about these solutions. But there are far more layers that people often add. Again, these diagrams that you see are often quite large and have so many solutions. The next one that probably is very crucial is the orchestration layer. This is kind of a combination often of either data pipelining tools or just a pure uh, orchestration tool. Some people like to do the piecemeal approach where you maybe have one solution for each of these steps, like in an ETL where you have an extract tool and a transform tool. But a lot of people are often just using solutions like Airflow or some out of the box solution that can help you actually process and manage the data workflows. I mean, even with Airflow, I had Ian uh, from Riot Games write a whole article discussing how they used Airflow to even manage their ML workflows. 
So often there is some set of tools here that is just meant to make it very easy to interact with the data stored uh, in your storage layer. Again, that could be anything from S3 to maybe a database, but having a solution that makes it very easy to push these data pipelines or these data workflows and making it very easy for all types of end users, you know, right? Like maybe it's a data engineer, maybe it's an analytics engineer, maybe it's an ML engineer that just needs to rerun their model every day. Having something there that makes that very easy is a core component to the whole idea of making data easy to interact with. And of course, at this point, you're just building what I like to often call as data infrastructure. You're often trying to build some sort of core layer of data. I think this is a key part of any data platform, which is, yes, there's going to be all these data and use cases, but there's this core data model that you have that represents your business, right? Like this is arguably what some people go for when they try to develop like an enterprise data model. You're trying to develop some thing that represents your business to the truest form, to the most granular form that you can, so that anyone in the future can come to your data platform and interact with it, ask questions from it, easily integrate that data. And I think a key part of that is that core data layer that again, almost acts as infrastructure in itself. Although it is data and there's code involved in creating it, it's something that hopefully doesn't change too often because so many people are gonna be relying on it. So it often requires a little more data lifecycle approach to it or a software life lifecycle approach to it where you're not just constantly changing it because you have another use case that you need to deploy, but instead you're looking at it constantly and being like, okay, it, does this represent our business? And that's the question you're constantly asking. You also need tools and, and processes, of course, that help manage governance and just general data management. So this could be things like data catalogs, such as data hub that make it easier for people to come and actually look to see what data actually exists. So although the catalog component might not be purely governed, it often does make it easier for the end user to actually find information that they need. Uh, again, back at Facebook, this was a key part of my life. I didn't have to often go and spend hours looking or, or trying to meet set up meetings with people to understand data, I could often uh, just go to the data catalog that we had internally there, look up um, some of the topics or entities that I was really caring about at the moment, uh, click into them, figure out where they came from, go into the pipelines that made them, you know, maybe go all the way back and trace it back, see what dashboards maybe relied on them, see if they already were dashboards that I wanted to build, if they already existed so I wouldn't rebuild them. And so it really made it that much easier for me to understand the data that existed, who owned that data, you know, who's actually still supporting it. Was it considered high quality? Cause you'd actually have like data quality scores on uh, the data catalog as well. And all of this just makes it that much easier. Again, it's always about making it easier for you to interact with the data. But on top of that, you have layers of governance that come in as well. So this could range anything from trying to make sure that, you know, you're using the same terminology across all of these teams. And I think that is a key component. And it also means you have things like policies in place to ensure, hey, maybe we don't have everyone interacting with this data. If it's something that's supposed to remain private, right? Like maybe uh, employee salary information should remain private unless the people uh, should be interacting with it. Or you're talking about more personal information from customers and making sure you have the right rules in place and the right processes to only give access to people in the right manner. And so that's also a key part because yes, you want the data to be easy to interact with, but you don't want it to be so easy that you start getting fined uh, or you start giving data to the wrong people that then maybe increase the chance of them losing it or having their computer hacked. And so this is a key part of the data platform. It can't just be, you know, oh, we're going to have all this cool technology. We're going to build this coolest chart. You know, everything's going to be great. Those are only some components um, of the data platform. And of course, there's the data servicing layer. And so this is where we're trying to go, right? Like you're trying to make the data useful. You've made the process. You've, you've, you've ingested the data. You've stored it in whatever tool you've, you've picked. You've orchestrated your you know, basic workflows, you've created a core data model, you're not just going to leave it there, right? Like that's not where the project ends. Now you need to actually do things with it, right? Whether that's making it easy to build dashboards, whether that's making it easy to deploy ML models, like that is all stuff that needs to be thought through, right? You don't want to just be like, hey, data scientists, please build this data model. You want to say, hey, how, if I came to this data, would I build a data model, right? Like that is a key part of the data platform. You can't just think about the technology, you have to think about the people aspect and the processes around them and how they can interact with this data. Again, we've talked about security and privacy, but also just making sure that when they do have access, that it isn't difficult for them to then deploy the code. Maybe we have a company standard in terms of how machine learning models are deployed. Again, things that <laughs> I was spoiled with at Facebook. I know not every company has it, but if you can, even if it's just a basic process of, you know, we only code in Python and we only deploy in Python or 
if you do deploy an R, you know, here's how you deploy an R and making sure it's very clear. I think all of that is very important to um, this service component, right? Like you don't just want to say like, hey, deploy models. You want to say, how are we going to do that? Now, when it comes to actually looking at how companies build their data platforms, there's plenty you can look at. For example, you can look up Netflix data platform, which I found a picture from the data hub uh, project where they were showing everything from how where the data came from. So the actual sources to how they then process that data with tools they use. So things like Kafka and data mesh, which is more of their internal tool. And then where that data actually ended up, like how they stored it in things like uh, S3 and then used Hive table formats and Iceberg table formats to kind of store all that data, had their tool in terms of storing metadata and building their catalog and then giving their company or giving their data teams multiple options when it came to actually processing. I think this is also important. They gave Trino, they gave Spark, they had Druid as well, uh, last search. And then from there, kind of fed it into their Jupyter notebooks and Tableau. And so that they have this full process, right? Like, so this is this is the technology component, right? Like there's a ton of other layers that go in here that are not limited to the technology. I think the technology is one aspect. But again, some companies are finding that they need even more when it comes to data platforms. Again, going back to the vast data reference, XAI recently just announced that they basically built their entire AI data platform on uh, vast data and about 100,000 NVIDIA GPUs. So they use NVIDIA GPUs and then put... Uh, vast data on top to run their giant AI platform. And so there are different types of platforms I think we'll see come about uh, in the next decade as people are trying to manage all of these various use cases. And sometimes your current data platform might only be able to handle a limited set of those use cases and you'll have to find different tooling um, to handle maybe more complex, you know, the unstructured data sets or things where LLMs start getting involved or ML workflows need to be faster or more efficient. So overall, the data platform term has definitely kind of been a generic term that people have used uh, over the last few years. I think it's important that, one, you understand the core reason you're doing what you're doing. So one, you're trying to make data easier for your end users to interact with and in such a way that doesn't, you know, break some sort of law in some case, especially as privacy becomes more of a concern. And that often has a mix of components that range from technology to processes. And so it's not just about the technology you pick, but also the teams and how they are uh, developed to actually manage those tools and manage the data and actually build on top of it. And I do think we're going to keep seeing more and more demanded of our data sets as people are going to be looking for things like how do we analyze our video data maybe in our store. I gave that example in a recent article where I think that's something interesting, where I'm sure how companies want to manage or process or ask questions from data that exceeds what we're currently doing, which is a lot of structured data analysis, we're going to want to get even more context from the information that we have access to. And it's important to understand that you have to pick uh, in all that the right teams, the right tools, and just the right setup so that you actually make your data easier to work with. With that, guys, I want to say thank you so much for watching this video, and I'll see you all in the next one. Thanks, all. Goodbye.